So um, today's an interesting historical uh, day. 230 years ago, uh, this was the day that uh, the Federalist uh, Papers were first published, the first installment, um, calling for ratification of the US Constitution. Uh, I mentioned it this morning um, because um, leadership has never been more important than it is right now. Our country is in a time of great uncertainty uh, and worry about all sorts of things, not just health care. Um, so what was true in Hamilton's day um, is certainly true today, um, that, that we need structure, we need leadership, we need engagement. And that's what I want to talk to you about uh, a little bit today. Um, serving as AMA president was a tremendous honor, uh, and it gave me the opportunity uh, to talk to diverse audiences uh, uh, across America and, in fact, across the world about what the AMA is doing uh, in the area of healthcare. Uh, and although I'm going to focus primarily on what the AMA is doing, uh, what we're doing is on behalf of our um, profession, uh, healthcare, uh, which many of you in the room uh, are involved in, um, and ultimately on behalf of patients, because that's what we're all here about. Um, we all need to be leaders. Uh, there's a woman named Ruth Messenger, who's a, a social worker, who uh, is fond of saying, we must become the leaders that we are waiting for. Uh, and if I leave, leave you with no other thought today, it's that. If I am only for me, um, if I'm not for me, who will be for me? If I am only for me, what am I? If not now, when? It's an old proverb, it's 2,000 years old. Um, but we need to engage, we need to get involved. Healthcare is an incredibly uh, complex tiger, but we need to, to work on, on taming it uh, to improve the health of our nation um, as, as a matter of, of justice, as a matter of ethics, but also as a matter of national survival. So 2017 obviously um, has been dominated by the debate over healthcare, um, um, and it's my hope that at some point, uh, all of the kabuki will stop, um, and that we will have a truly thoughtful and bipartisan discussion about where we go, how we uh, become uh, good stewards of clearly limited resources, um, and uh, that both sides will be able to step back and, and figure this out. Um, healthcare, as you know, is deeply personal, uh, and we can never let it fall victim to political polarization. Uh, as America's physicians, and healthcare workers, we have um, a professional responsibility always to speak out on behalf of our patients uh, when their health and their well-being is threatened. We must use the, our position as leaders uh, to uphold the principles of medicine and seek ways to uh, improve access to healthcare, not to strip it away. We do that through advocacy, and this has been one of the passions of my um, career in leadership. Um, physicians and uh, I would submit to you perhaps nurses and other healthcare workers as well have not been as engaged in advocacy uh, as we need to be. Um, the reason why we must insert ourselves into this debate uh, is because no one understands better than we do how actions in Congress will affect our patients. No one can tell our stories better than we can. Stories about our frustrations dealing with electronic health records that steal time away from our patients, yet add nothing to the quality of care. Stories about the futility of writing prescriptions that patients cannot fill because of obscenely high drug prices and crushing deductibles and copays. We are the ones who see the sheer idiocy of insurance that covers the intricate surgeries that people like me perform, but not the post-op therapy that makes them work particularly germane to you since you have one of the few OT programs, hand therapy programs in the state. And in fact, I'm going to go visit it later today, so I, I do know a little bit about what's going on here. Um, our voice matters, our experience matters, and our insights matter. Uh, as America's doctors, nurses, and therapists, we have a responsibility to make our voices heard. We have a responsibility to advocate for our patients and our profession. If we won't, who will? The AMA understands that we prioritize time with our patients above all else. No other organization is better positioned to take on these challenges and to help us navigate the increasingly complex world of medicine. So let's start with a brief look at who the AMA is, 
and what we represent. The AMA represents 186 state specialty and subspecialty societies. There's even two hand societies, the right, right hand society and the left hand society. Uh, long story about that, but there's a, an association and a, and a society for hand surgery. Um, we represent people at multiple life uh, cycle stages, starting from students, going through residents, young physicians, mature physicians, and retired physicians. Multiple practice settings, independent solo practitioners like me, small groups, large groups like the one that Dave managed, um, employed, integrated, group practices, academic practices, public health physicians. No other organization is better um, positioned to unify and to advocate on behalf of physicians, the profession, and our patients. That's especially important in times of change. While we won't agree on all points, and we certainly don't agree on all points, uh, we will agree on putting our patients first and protecting the profession from excessive and burdensome regulation. Our House of Delegates, which is sort of the Congress of the AMA, meets twice a year with the to representatives from state and specialty societies. Uh, the House, uh, led by its Board of Trustees, establishes policy for the AMA. Our board is a strong and diverse group uh, and exactly the kind of board that we need to capture the many perspectives uh, of our profession and to develop solutions for our most pressing challenges. The House of Delegates creates policies that help us address the most current and pressing issues uh, of the day. So for example, when you read that the AMA opposes tobacco, or that the AMA supports or opposes something, that is based on policy that is established in a very democratic way um, by the AMA House of Delegates. Um, your Secretary of uh, Health for the Commonwealth, Dr. Bill Hazel, who is here, um, I first met um, in the AMA House of Delegates, uh, and we've been friends for, for a long time from now. Um, since its founding 170 years ago, the AMA has had a positive influence on public health in the United States. We developed standards for medical education, the code of medical ethics, and we have been fighting epidemics and pushing for universal vaccination and greater access to health insurance. The AMA has either led or contributed to all of the major public health achievements of the last 170 years, and we will not stop. We continue to work to advocate for patients and physicians and to improve the health for all Americans. The AMA is demonstrating leadership in medicine by elevating the physician voice on state and national issues that matter, by partnering with tech innovators on new digital breakthroughs that will transform clinical practice. I'll talk about these a little bit later. By arming physicians with the resources we need to thrive under value-based care. By harnessing the power of health data in new ways to improve patient outcomes and achieve, achieve true intraoperability uh, across systems and by helping to reinvent medical education so that our doctors of tomorrow are better trained and equipped to work in increasingly diverse and technology-driven environments. This is the future that the AMA is helping to create. So let's talk a little bit about how we do that. Of course, we're working in an environment of constant change. Today's healthcare system is increasingly high-tech and high-regulation. It is increasingly focused on chronic disease management more than acute care, increasingly uh, demanding high value care. And at the same time, and in many cases because of this, physicians are overwhelmed by external demands like burdensome regulations and technology that doesn't live up to its promise. At a time like this, we need physician leadership to envision and shape a better future to provide resources and to support um, the improvement of the practice environment, to advocate for physicians and patients in today's polarized political environment. We need physician leadership, and we need your leadership with us to take healthcare forward, not backward. Who is answering that call? I would submit to you um, that it must be everyone here in this room, uh, and uh, physicians and healthcare workers um, throughout the country who are concerned about where medicine is going. As individuals and as organizations, we are working together to answer that call for leadership. The challenge for consumers in this ever-changing environment is that historically, 
And even before the Affordable Care Act, too many were simply priced out of coverage or couldn't get adequate coverage because of a pre-existing condition or other factors. Healthcare costs in the United States have been rising steadily for generations. As of 2016, we had by far the most expensive healthcare system of any uh, OECD country, those are the economically advanced um, countries. Uh, and we were spending close to $10,000 for every man, woman, and child in the US. That's twice what Germany spends and far ahead of countries such as Japan, Canada, Spain, and all the others. Since we're in a business school, I have to tell you that you have to look critically at the data. There are a number of things that go into this, and I don't have a chance to answer or even talk about all of them today. The first is that in many countries, social service budgets are a separate line item, and they are included in the US healthcare spending. So things like home health care, uh, some physical therapy, some vis visitation services, um, uh, day clinics, things like that, those are all included in the US number. They are not included in other countries. So you have to, if you're gonna make a true comparison, which is not on the slide, you have to add that in to the other countries. We're still spending more per person than everybody else, but it's not as bad as this slide would make you believe. The other thing is that the United States, culturally, geographically, um, has challenges that no other country faces. First and foremost is the legacy of slavery, which still very much influences um, the socioeconomics of this country. It, it influences healthcare um, in all sorts of ways. We are culturally diverse in ways that Europe um, and other countries are not. We have um, southern immigration from all of Central and, and uh, Latin America and the Caribbean in ways that Europe is beginning to, to uh, experience now with the immigration from the Middle East and North Africa, but that has been a problem for the United States for a long time. Um, we have cultural differences. The, the, uh, uh, the United States is the land of the free. We are cowboys. We are committed to individual freedoms, to, uh, to individual determination. People in Europe and other countries are much more culturally attuned to the notion of their responsibility to the state. Um, President Kennedy's famous inaugural line, ask not what the country can do for you, but what um, you can do for your country, is a marvelous line for an American. It is a statement of the obvious to most Europeans. And again, when we talk about comparing the United States health system to other places, I don't hear people talk much about um, cultural uh, effects of this. By the way, none of this is in the speech that the AMA gave me to come give me, but these are the <laughs> <laughs> I think the bolt would actually strike it. I actually read the speech that they held over here. Um, but um, these are all things that since we're talking about healthcare, we're talking about challenges, and you as leaders need to be aware of these things, and this is the only time I get to give you all of this good insight. So, so anyway, these are all the things that, that go into a graph like this, um, and, and others as well. We have geographic challenges. You understand that the state of Montana is bigger than half of the countries in Europe. Um, so when, when you talk about a healthcare system, um, you talk about geographic challenges that you don't have in Paris. Um, you know, so um, anyway, uh, now back to the switch. Four in 10 adults um, are, are uh, with health insurance say they have difficulty affording their deductibles. Uh, roughly one third say they have trouble affording their premiums and other cost sharing um, items. Three in 10 Americans report problems paying medical bills. Uh, and these problems come with real consequences for some, such as cutting back spending on food, clothing, or basic household items. One of the things I first did when I was president was I, I um, um, hit the ground running with EpiPens. These are the, the epinephrine uh, discharge pens that, that uh, kids who have allergies need to have in their backpacks um, uh, or on the soccer fields. And I talked um, on, on a, a national TV show about how can you put pay, uh, parents in a position of choosing between safety equipment like a, a better football helmet for one kid and the EpiPen for another. There are real consequences, um, real life human consequences for all of these things. And we are the ones who have to tell them. 
And it doesn't matter if you're a therapist, a nurse, a doctor, whatever. We are all seeing patients. We are all seeing these stories. And the most effective way to advocate is to tell human stories. Graphs, statistics, people roll their eyes. Stories are what we remember. 27% of people say that they have um, put off or postponed getting health care that they need. So what are the factors contributing to these costs? Um, there is a rising toll of preventable illness. 75% um, of the spending in this country is for people with chronic conditions and that these are behaviorally influenced. For the record, I want you to know I'm a very healthy fat guy. I work out five days. Um, the problem is I eat seven days. <laughs> kind of, kind of reverse them. There are inefficiencies in the healthcare system, fragmented care, lack of comparative effectiveness research, missed opportunities to provide lifestyle counseling. There are non-clinical health system costs that do nothing to contribute to patient care, uh, such as time spent on poorly designed electronic health records, prior authorization requests, excessive regulation. I'll come back to prior authorization in a bit. Um, we want new drugs, new technologies, new services, um, and, and everybody wants the, the newest pill that's uh, um, being advertised on television. Who can, can uh, not want a chance to live longer? Even if the chance to live longer is six weeks, two months, we'll make you hard, we sit the whole time and cost $75,000. That's not even in the sun, fine print at the bottom. And I don't want to pick on one um, drug or one campaign in particular. Um, but um, there is, we are one of only two countries in the world that allows direct to consumer advertising, the other is New Zealand. Um, and that certainly is a, is a contributor into drug costs. Uh, health plans and hospitals are increasingly gaining market share and are better able to demand higher premiums and prices. Um, the AMA has taken a, uh, a very leading role in that. I testified in Congress uh, at the House Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on uh, Antitrust against the Anthem Cigna and Aetna Humana mergers. Uh, fascinating thing. If we have time at the coffee break, I'll tell you more. Um, we have supply and demand problems and legal issues that complicate the efforts to slow spending. Defensive medicine um, is a huge cost driver. I will tell you as an orthopedic surgeon, and Bill Hazel will uh, back me up on this, that uh, there's a lot of MRIs, there's a lot of other things that are being ordered um, for the courtroom, um, not necessarily for clinical indications. Health outcomes uh, will lag behind. Um, our return on investment for all this spending, even though we spend more than anybody else, um, is, uh, is lagging. We rank 19th among the industrialized nations in, in overall patient outcomes, 42nd in life expectancy. But again, with all of the things that I just talked about, that people, just, uh, legacy of slavery, uh, illegal immigration, cultural issues, that all plays into that. So, Along with our important advocacy work, uh, the AMA has developed a strategic vision uh, to help physicians manage changes ahead uh, in the healthcare system uh, and support the development in every way. Uh, we call these our strategic arcs, and I want to spend a little time um, going over them with you. Um, they include timely essential tools and resources for physicians to guide their professional development and working with them to, to navigate through the system. Um, I could spend an hour on each one of these parts of the art, but uh, the tools, uh, these are things for physicians um, uh, that are all available on our website, um, and uh, uh, these are to help people navigate through all sorts of different areas in healthcare. I'm not going to dwell much on them here. Um, we are developing an innovation ecosystem. Um, on this slide are all sorts of different things that we're involved in. Uh, there's a couple I want to point out to you. Exertia, which is on the bottom right, um, is a partnership with the tech industry to provide gold standards, benchmarks for apps. Um, there are 100,000 health-related apps that go through the App Store or the Android equivalent. Um, some of them were egregiously bad. There was one that said it could tell you blood pressure by just holding it up to a body part. It was accurate um, two out of 10 times. Um, there was another one that um, uh, would take a picture of uh, some pigmented area on your skin and tell you what, what the chances were that it was a melanoma. Accurate less than three uh, out of 10 times. 
there are real world consequences to people running around saying my blood pressure is fine, Siri told me so. <laughs> or um, no, this, this bump um, is, is not a melanoma because Alexa says it's cool. Um, so we worked with the FDA to get those pulled off the market. Uh, we can't do that for each of 100,000 apps and we have no intention of conferring the good housekeeping seal of approval, but um, we are going to develop benchmarks um, for, uh, for the industry and we're working with a lot of tech partners to do that. So that's, that's uh, really interesting. Uh, and the other one in the middle, Health 2047. Um, this is a, um, an innovation lab we have out in Silicon Valley. Uh, and we are working with some incredibly smart people, including the guy who invented Siri, um, to try to solve some of the tech problems like electronic health records, the fact that they don't talk to one another. These guys look at the problems very differently than we do. They just think it's a data set and your electronic health record is, a, is an interface. You don't like your interface? Fine, we'll make you another one. Um, so there are going to be some very exciting things coming out of that um, very soon. Um, and something that, that just um, hit uh, last week um, is the I IHMI, the Integrated Health Model Initiative. This is an, an initiative um, with several partners, including IBM Watson, uh, and Cerner, uh, which is a large electronic health uh, record company, um, to use big data, to use Watson's capability for analyzing big data trends, uh, to try to make um, some sense out of all of this information that's out there and make it accessible to, to physicians um, in a usable form. Physicians are incredibly data-driven. The problem is we don't have access to the data, we don't have time to, um, to garner it on our own or, or to make sense of it once we get it. Um, so uh, we are going to deal with things like interoperability. Uh, you know, it doesn't do you any good if, if you have an electronic health record but it won't talk to the electronic health record of the hospital that your patient is just discharged to uh, from rather, um, or you can't access um, the uh, report that you need from, from another facility. So we're, we're working uh, on, on all of these. Uh, we are guiding professional development among physicians with all sorts of um, tools. There is tremendous physician burnout, 54% uh, profession-wide. In some um, branches of the profession, it is over 60%. Uh, ER doctors, urologists, not sure why the urologists, the chief medical officer is a urologist. <laughs> we can figure that out. Um, in, in my specialty, orthopedics is 54%, and we're supposed to be the fun guys. And Bill, that's why we went into orthopedics. The surgery is fun, the guys are fun, and afterwards we go out and run and push ups and stuff. And 54% and, um, uh, of us are, are burned out. So it's, it's, a, it's across the system, people are retiring early, um, physician behavior and acting out and, and other sorts of things uh, um, is a problem. And what, what I tell lay audiences when I talk to them, is you need to be aware of this. This is important for you because by any metric you care to measure, physicians who are happy in their work, satisfied, fulfilled, provide better medical care. So yes, you should bring us cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so we are we are working to to give physicians tools to to um, recapture the work life balance and, and recapture the joy in what we did. Your president talked earlier about uh, this uh, poor girl who, who died. Um, she mentioned that the doctor and the nurses were there at her bedside. Mm -hmm. That is the incredible privilege and the joy of medicine. And that is what drives me to do what I do, to try to help my brethren recapture that. Because there is nothing more intimate and someone coming to you and saying, take care of me. You get to know people, you get to interact with people in ways that are unbelievable. And you'll see this in, in um, any of the healthcare professions, not limited to doctors. In fact, sometimes doctors are so busy as the nurses who get the privilege of, of, of entering in that part of the world. Um, but it is an incredible privilege, it's an incredible honor, and, and that's why I do what we do. Um, <coughs> Sorry, your president isn't here, but I'll talk to you about it 
uh, later. One of the things that, that we're, we're dealing with is uh, advancing changes in, in medical education. When, when you look into it, um, Bill Hazel and I were trained in a model that went back to the latter half of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. That's two years of, of um, basic science, two years of clinical uh, exposure patterned around departments in the hospital. Well, the fact is that if I want to know what the Krebs cycle is, I'll Google it. Um, in fact, almost anything that I learn in the first two years of medical school can be had in two seconds in my smartphone. So we have to look again at the whole idea of a medical library. Now understand that the medical library is terribly important because that's about where half the medical students meet their spouses, their ultimate spouses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we can figure out something else to do that. Um, but the fact is the entire National Library of Medicine is accessible on my smartphone. Um, we need to, to rethink the way we teach, the way we test. Most medical care is not delivered in hospitals. Most medical care is delivered by teams, not by physicians solo. So we actually have um, come up with a, a textbook on health system science. I don't know if I have a slide for that. But anyway, we, we, we convened um, about 11 schools to start coming up with, with new ideas um, for, for transforming medical education, different ways to teach students. We expanded that consortium to 32 schools. Um, and out of this um, came the appreciation that there was a whole idea, a whole new science of studying the way teams provide care, the way patients access from a system. Uh, and this includes uh, familiarity with, with large data sets and, and uh, other sorts of things. So this is a textbook that we published last year. Um, all right. Another key priority is chronic care. Um, Dr. Davis, how am I doing on time? Right? Oh, good. All right. Um, when I went to medical school, most medicine was acute disease. Um, we dealt with saving people from heart attacks. We dealt with tuberculosis, with strep, stab. Then when I was a resident, we dealt with HIV/AIDS. Um, we're still dealing with that. We're still dealing with Zika and, and with, with other emerging infections. But 75% of the spending um, in this country is now on chronic diseases. Number one and number two are diabetes and hypertension, high blood pressure. So um, we focused on those. Um, and um, there are um, 86 million people in this country who have pre-diabetes. That's defined as a high fasting blood sugar, but not so high as, as you would consider to have type 2 diabetes. 86 million have it. 90% of them don't know it. Many of their physicians don't know it or don't recognize it as a distinct sort of pre-disease state. And up to 35% of them will develop type 2 diabetes, um, which carries with it, as, as many of you know, the risks of amputation, blindness, stroke, premature death. So we have a, um, a campaign uh, called doihaveprediabetes.org uh, where people can go and take a simple five question test about what the risk is um, to that refer them to their doctor to, to um, uh, start dealing with that. We partnered with the National YMCA program uh, because they have very good diabetes prevention programs. It's not just the Y, there are others as well. And we successfully lobbied so that starting in 2018, Medicare will cover these diabetes prevention programs uh, as a covered benefit for Medicare beneficiaries. We've also worked with a number of national employers, Lowe's, Delta Airlines, Costco, and Iron Mountain, where people shred medical records. Um, and, and I'm sure by now there are others, but those are the four that I know that include this as a zero copay um, uh, benefit for, for their workers because they understand that. Uh, the success rate of these programs, if you complete them, is very high, and the savings are good. That's how we got Medicare um, to approve it, was the actuaries were finally convinced that, that it made sense, that the money spent for this would be, um, would be recouped in the, the uh, uh, savings for, for treating it. So pre-diabetes is a big one, um, and uh, blood pressure is the other one. Um, 
80 million um, people in this country, it's a third of the adult population, have high blood pressure. Um, somewhere around 30 million have a known diagnosis of high blood pressure, a regular source of medical care, and yet are uncontrolled. Um, so we have been studying how and why this happens. Uh, we've worked with a couple of different places, a community health center in uh, uh, Baltimore through Johns Hopkins, and a, uh, another uh, five-site uh, primary care system in South Carolina, and the results are striking. Using nurses, using community workers, using resources within the community um, to get to people to um, check on are they filling the prescription. I talked earlier about the idiocy of my writing the prescription and then the patient not being able to fill it because he can't afford it. Um, so uh, there are all sorts of um, uh, different things that influence this. Uh, cultural competency comes into play. Um, it turns out that among the Gullah population in, in the low countries, um, mustard is considered a health food. Um, so um, anybody know how to make mustard? Mustard seed, vinegar, salt. There is as much as a teaspoon of salt in a tablespoon of mustard in some preparations. So you can go through all of this, and people come in and they swear on a stack of Bible that they're doing everything that they told you. We're not buying the, the, the can anything. We're making the frozen peas, and, and or we're growing them in the garden, and not putting salt in the water and everything. And blood pressure is still out of control. Why? Well, I have high blood pressure. I'm sick. I need a health food. Mustard. Boom. So. You have to understand that on a, a deep personal cultural level, otherwise you can't, you can't effectively do what you're going to do. Um, there are lots of other reasons, and we're working on scaling that. We now have 400 practices um, that are on board with this program, and, and we hope to disseminate it uh, nationwide. So, um, so that's more of our blood pressure medicine uh, advocacy. Um, th this. Um, is at the heart of, of what the AMA does, and it, it's also near and dear to, to me because I consider it to be custody of the profession. Um, I think it's an important professional responsibility, and it's not just for doctors, it's for everybody here. Um, you know, we will all have a responsibility to lifelong learning. Just because you graduate from here, uh, those of you who are students, doesn't mean that your learning stops. Um, certainly in, in the field of hand therapy, uh, which is close to my heart. There are always new innovations, new products, new techniques um, in any one of your fields that will be. So there will be a responsibility to keep up. But there's also a responsibility to advocate, to tell your stories, to get engaged with, with your legislators um, because it doesn't do any good if these uh, techniques are available but they're not accessible. Um, so get involved. Um, and you do this by establishing relationships uh, over long term uh, with your legislators. So um, just a bit about uh, what the AMA is doing. I'll gloss over this uh, to leave time for questions. But um, many of you have heard about MACRA. This is the new payment paradigm that is supposed to um, help rein in costs for fee-for-service. Uh, and this is a slide that just illustrates that um, what we have now, uh, although there are penalties, they are less than uh, uh, than they were under the old system. And we have a, a number of uh, tools to help docs do that. Um, we're working to, to um, make electronic health records more, um, more responsive. Um, you have a prescription drug monitoring program we talk about opioids uh, at breakfast. Um, it doesn't do any good if it takes five minutes to sign into it. You have a 15 minute visit. Um, it has to be integrated into the electronic health record, so we're working on that. I want to talk to you just for a moment about prior authorization because it's one of the big bugaboos. Um, and uh, we've been working hard on it. You'll all see this in your practice. If you're a therapist, you may need to get authorization for a patient. Um, you know, the insurance company says that uh, they get six visits, but six visits doesn't make, the, doesn't make the patient recover from the stroke. It doesn't make the flexor tendon repair that I do work. Um, so we have to go through this prior authorization. So here's a real world story. I'm the president of the AMA, and it happened to me. Um, my insurance company, now my Medicare, but, but my um, former insurance company, um, they have the evil empire, um, would allow a drug called Malarone, 
uh, which is a malaria prophylaxis. They would allow 12 pills to be dispensed without prior authorization. Now, malarum has to be taken two days before you go and for seven days after you get back. Who do you know goes to Africa for three days? <laughs> I'm the guy who went to Guam for dinner, but even I didn't go to Africa for, for three days. So um, we had to go through a prior authorization process. The average primary care physician goes through 37 a week. Um, each one takes about a half an hour, so that's a half a full-time equivalent to do nothing that adds to the quality of care. And this is the kind of idiocy that, that the AMA is working uh, with. And, and there's been some success. We have um, uh, a company up in New York who moved 200, um, procedures from its, its prior off list, and Molina Healthcare out west uh, removed 2,000. So um, we're getting there. I'm gonna uh, run through the, the rest of the slides because I do wanna leave a couple minutes. Um, we are obviously working on health system reform. Um, patients before politics is a catchy kind of phrase, but uh, um, anyway, thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to, to be here and have the opportunity to dialogue with you a little bit, and you'll tell me if we have time for questions.